Episode number one. All right, that sounds good. We should keep that. I like that. All right, so why don't you introduce yourself? All right, my name is Jason Gauchi, and uh, I'm a software engineer, but uh, by day, by night, work on uh, emulators, work on like MAME with the MAME team, and MESS, the MESS emulator, and uh, different open source projects, and just overall general hacker. All right, that's pretty good. I, I wouldn't. What I, about you? What are you up to? It's pretty modest sounding, but uh, <laughs> I know you do a lot more than that. I, mine pales by comparison, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm Patrick Wheeler and uh, coder by day and uh, general do house chores around the house at night. <laughs> Sleeper by night. Yeah, I, I was digging in the dark tonight trying to fix my sprinkler. So. Oh man, how did that go? Uh, it, it worked. I, I finally got it done in the pitch black, spraying myself with reclaimed water. So, <laughs> oh nice. But it's all fixed now. Oh man, uh, I raked my yard and it's uh, there's nothing underneath. Like the rake, I just kept raking. When I was done, there's just dirt. Oh, so I'm in pretty. Coding is shape. way more fun than digging in the dirt. Yeah, definitely agreed. Uh, yeah. good stuff. All right, well let's go ahead and get get started here. Mm. So all do you right. have any news for us, Jason? Yeah, let's see. So, yeah, I guess we have this news about this PS3 um, hacker guy getting back at Sony and Sony going back and forth with him. Um, George Hotz, Geo Hot is his, uh, is his internet pseudonym. And uh, he's one of a group, uh, I guess he's teaming up with Fail Overflow, which is uh, another hacker group. And uh, together they were able to hack the PS3. And uh, this is uh, pretty cool for people who want to sort of run homebrew software, whether it's emulators or just nice little apps. You want to just take advantage of the PS3 hardware in a way that, uh, you know, no one else has really thought of. Um, this gives you that, that opportunity. I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I saw a little bit about that. The way he did it, uh, he like was able to figure out the private key for the, that Sony was using to sign its executables. Yeah, so uh, the key is all based on these random number, uh, this random number generator. But uh, they found out diving through the um, assembly code that the random number generator was just returning six. You know, so uh, that's a random. Yeah, so uh, totally, uh, the encryption completely falls apart when uh, the RNG is just returning six the whole time. And uh, between you know figuring that out and some other hacks uh, in hardware they were able to completely unlock the PS3. They were able to get to the point where now they can write, uh, or you even you at home can write signed apps for the PS3. And, and the PS3 hardware thinks that you're a you know professional developer, even though you're some kid in your basement. So that must make Sony pretty scared, right? I mean, no yeah. control of their platform now. Yeah, I mean, Sony, Sony's lost that uh, DRM that you know they were really trying to hold on to, and they'd, been, they'd prided themselves on you know being the only console that hadn't been hacked. So, uh, yeah, they're going and suing George Hotz, and they're also trying to shut down his website. It's gone so far, they actually sued, or they actually commandeered the IP addresses of anyone who's been to his website and the username of, of anyone who's uh, seen his YouTube video. So, I mean, this is really starting to get into personal privacy. That, that seems ridiculous. Uh, yeah, uh, I can't imagine that, you know, they can get away with stuff like that. Yeah, visiting a website is now a crime. I don't, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's something straight out of 1984, right? They're yeah. going to start knocking on your door. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, but that doesn't sound very good precedence to set. No, definitely. No, I just hope that it, it, uh, you know, that they can appeal that and then it can go further on in the courts and everything. Is it too late, though? They already got all the IP addresses? And, I mean, once you have that information, I guess the ISPs have to comply so they can figure out who those IP addresses really are. But Yeah, I don't know, like, if, you know... If you if you can appeal something like that, I'm assuming you can do it before they get the IP addresses. Oh, that's true. They probably the judge orders you know whoever to turn over the IP address, but they don't do it immediately. They probably have time to do it. Yeah, exactly. There's this awesome video. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. These fail overflow guys going in like explicit detail on what they uh you know how they pulled off this hack and everything. Is this a uh, watch at your own peril video? 
<laughs> yeah, this is the kind of video that if you watch, you might end up um, as part of some court case. So uh, let's put that disclaimer out there. You might need to opt out next time you go to the airport if you watch this video. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, they might take naked pictures of you if you <laughs> if you watch this video. But yeah, we'll put it on the blog, a uh, link to it with a disclaimer. Okay. All right. Sounds good. What about you? You got any news today? Oh, man. So I saw today that Nokia is going to, you know, try to sell off or relicense their QT. And um, I guess this is as part of them switching from their own OS, the Symbian OS, I guess, to yep. Windows 7, or at least have that emphasis. So as part of that, I guess they're trying to divest the QT stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense. Nokia is kind of in trouble, right? Because they... Yeah. Uh, they were doing so good, you know, they had such a huge market share originally because they didn't have any competition. Like, once the smartphones started coming out, they were just really in trouble. Well, this is interesting to me, uh, you know, from a technical standpoint, from the market, I guess not from the technical standpoint, from the market standpoint, though, that and it's my understanding Nokia has a huge, you know, market share in overseas. I, I know some people from... Um, Africa, and they were saying like all the phones there are Nokia, and they're mostly the you know what do they call them? feature phones, right? Not smartphones. So I don't. Yep. I guess it's a matter of pride for Nokia to say they have the best smartphone or a great smartphone. But it seems like you can make a pretty good living off of you know dominating the non-smartphone market, which at this point is still bigger than the smartphone market. Yeah, definitely. I think also another. Uh, direction another avenue that Nokia is trying to get into is the trying to cut into BlackBerry's market a little bit. Uh, they've been uh, teaming business. with Microsoft. Yeah, Microsoft's really the only person out there who can compete with BlackBerry on the enterprise level. You know, yeah. I mean, no one can sync with Outlook like Microsoft. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I would hope. So, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe not. At least, at least <laughs> Microsoft might be able to do it. Yeah, potential is there. <laughs> Uh, uh, so if they team up, you know, they might be able to edge BlackBerry out, which is just another competitor for BlackBerry. BlackBerry's, I think, in some trouble. I think competition's good, you know, drives innovation at some level. So yeah, it's true. There's competition on the on the you know, I guess the consumer side with with the iPhone and the versus the Android. And so, but really, BlackBerry's sort of in its own world, and yeah. corporations don't really have a choice right now. Hmm. So uh, on that note, um, Friday iPad 2 is coming out. You're going to be in Oh, line? yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about it, but uh, I'm just not sure. The uh, the Zune looks looks really good. It's it's kind of pricey, though. Um, you know, in the end, yeah. most users out there, you know, don't need all that uh, all that memory, you know, all that... Uh, um, RAM? Speed? Uh, is, what does it use? Does flash. it use, like, flash? flash. Yeah, okay. Yeah, most people don't need that much flash. Um, I sure, I, I sure don't. I mean, my plan would be to put uh, comics on there, and I could put just you know pretty much every every I have every X Men comic, and it's only like four gig. So, uh, yeah. and I don't need all that on the pad. So, the Zune's looking pretty good, but at that price point, I don't know. I think I'm gonna have to stick with the iPad too. It might be in line when it comes out. Yeah, I think uh, I, I might. I'm probably gonna pass for now, but I think my dad's gonna get one. So uh, that should be. Interesting. Oh, really? Yeah, my brother maybe too as well. So if they have them and are playing with them, I'll probably get Envy and uh, might show up with one shortly after. Nice. Did did either of them have a Mac like a MacBook Pro? Or no, like actually, that? interesting enough, nobody in my family has uh, any MacBooks or Mac computers. We do all almost all now have iPhones though. Oh okay. So. What about iPods? Did you guys jump on the iPod? No, thing? no. I would have no interest in getting iPods. Really? Yeah. I mean, the iPod oh, Touch, you know, is really nice. But by the time I was interested enough to do that, I had an iPhone. So. Yeah, the iPod Touch came out a little bit too late. I think yeah. it actually didn't it come out after the iPhone, or maybe like right I, around the same. It seems time. like it did. Yeah. 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 So, but yeah, before that, I just had generic whatever, you know, Sansa MP3 player. You know, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't an Apple product. Uh, so your dad isn't going to go for the Zoom, I guess. No, not the Zoom. I don't know. <laughs> oh, Zoom, yeah. Yeah, are you, I thought you were saying Zoom and I was just mishearing you. But, okay. Yeah, you were I don't saying know. Zoom, which is the Microsoft MP3 player. Oh, is that what that is? So now all our listeners are completely confused. Yeah, everybody's just, ah, oh, it's all over the place. You can send emails, <laughs> care of Jason, for confusing Yeah, so, mind. yeah, that's a good point. If you want to write hate mail, um, <laughs> write it to P. Wheeler. No, <laughs> Uh, actually, you can send email. We have our email address, uh, programmingthrowdown at gmail dot com. They can uh, send that's right. There. We're yeah, both we're both we're, we're both reading that. So 
Yeah, um, definitely, you know, send us your comments, give us your feedback, tell us what languages you want, um, because we will learn just about anything, or at least oh, we'll we should try to learn that. anything. Well, okay, hang on, hang on. Let, one more, one more news item I had. Uh, Facebook bought Beluga, and this is not terribly interesting in itself. Beluga is a group messaging app, I guess, that basically you send text messages to a Beluga number and the Beluga resends them out to people in your group. So it's a way like if, you know, you and a group of friends go to a theme park, you can all keep in touch with each other over text messages and not have to pay to send it to four people, just to one number. And then that number will redistribute to everybody. Oh, um, interesting. So, so that's kind of interesting. And there's a couple other applications doing something similar. But uh, then I saw some analysis where people are saying that they think Facebook's going to make a run at the SMS itself by by uh, every phone now having a Facebook application, if you can send SMS from within Facebook, that'll be data, not text messaging. And a lot of people will be happy to get rid of those expensive text messaging plans. Oh, that is so, uh, you know, so good. So much, that is fantastic news because SMS is just ridiculous. Is They're just making a killing off that. Yeah. So that was the last bit of news I had. Okay. So now on to what, what you were talking about. Um, so what is the purpose of this uh, podcast, Jason? Let me tell us. All right, let's let's take a take a shot at this. So, um, basically, what we want to do is throw down a new language every uh every show. Every in this case, we're looking at uh, making a show every couple weeks, and uh, what we want to do is just take on a new language. Uh, you know, we'll spend a couple of weeks uh beforehand learning it ourselves, and then we'll spend a couple weeks after, uh, you know, continuing what we've uh, talked about and uh, you know, advancing on that. And uh, the goal is just to learn new languages all the time, find out what languages are appropriate for uh, what tasks, what are the pros and cons, all that good stuff, uh, and to just share that knowledge with you guys out there and to also, uh, you know, give you guys some uh, more tools for the toolbox when you guys are out there, uh, you know, doing engineering and coding things up. Yeah, tools for the toolbox. That's how I always like to think about it that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right tool for the right job. Yeah, I mean, you know, nowadays languages have come so far, and there are some languages that are so high level um, and so efficient, such as uh, you know Java and Python, and there are other languages that are, have been extremely optimized with you know SSE and different compiler tools, so namely C and C++. That uh, you just you have a wide array of of uh, opportunity as a programmer. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So uh, what languages right now, um, before we embark on this journey, you know, what languages <laughs> would you call yourself uh, qualified to program in? My favorite language has always been C++. That's uh, what, uh, what they taught us in school, um, you know, uh, in ninth grade or whatever. So I've been kind of sticking to that. But uh, I'm also pretty familiar with C, like Java. I like Python a lot. Um, getting into, I did a little bit of Lisp. And so I'm starting to get into uh, Scheme a little bit just to understand it. Uh, but yeah, I'd say those are my favorites. What about you? Yeah, mine are pretty similar. I actually started off learning, I guess, C++ in high school and college did Java. Um, there's some interesting stuff there, especially since even it hasn't been that long since I've been out of school. But you know, Java's come kind of far even in just that little time as far as uh, fixing a lot of the complaints about slowness. So that's been interesting. Yeah, um, definitely. Also do a little bit of Python. Um, D done some kind of crazy stuff in, I guess, what is that, Lab View and Visual Basic here and there. Uh, some a little bit of C sharp. Um, oh, nice. And uh, did a little iPhone programming, so that'd be Objective C. Um, yep. So that that's pretty much. But mostly, you know, I'd say ninety percent of my stuff spent in, you know, C C plus plus. Yeah, definitely. I mean, those are, you know, as a programmer out there, if you're a your kids starting to get into programming, those are going to be your core languages that you'll always have to keep, you know, coming back to. Yeah, I mean, I think, and in some places, I guess, people tell me, you know, it hasn't been my experience yet, but people tell me that there's places where Java is, you know, the de facto standard. But I think learning C or C++ or Java, you can transition back and forth with a little bit of training, but not too much. The concepts are pretty similar. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then there are some languages like uh, like Go and Erlang. Uh, you know, and Lisp and Prolog, which are just way off the charts. And you really have to, you know, change the way you think and change your paradigm to, to, to get your hands around those languages. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a conversation about this with somebody at work talking about that, you know, I had been doing C++ for a little while and really liked some of the, you know, object-oriented stuff that we were doing in there and then uh, had to write some C code for a, 
very low level processor and uh, was able to take a lot of this stuff I learned out of C++ and use it in C even without, you know, just doing classes, the stuff that you learn is applicable. And I try yeah. to do the same with, you know, Python or, you know, hopefully as part of this getting into, you know, like Haskell, OCaml, like you've talked about, you know, Lisp, Scheme, whatever, those kind of languages and not even just writing code in them, but taking the lessons learned, the way of thinking and applying that to my everyday coding. Yeah, definitely. It always seems like every language has one or two things that um, it can teach you just about programming and about about computation in general. Yeah, make you feel so, a little bit smarter. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're doing. Our goal here is to make everybody out there feel a little smarter and uh, a little better about you know software engineering and make you feel good about yourself. And challenge you to broaden your horizons. That's right. That's right. Horizons will be broadened. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> but hopefully you'll it could like be, it. It could be against your will. It's possible that you have this playing in your car stereo and uh, you're just you're engaged in the highway and cannot turn it off. So we apologize. We pity you. Pull That's over okay. now. Yeah, it's not worth it. I know you have to get to work, but. <laughs> and if you're still with us, despite all of that convincing persuasion. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, let's talk about the tool of the day. All right. Uh, let's see. What would my tool of the day be Do you today? have one? Yeah, I'm just going through my programs here. Are oh, you looking on your computer? I guess I could talk about uh, comics with an X. Comics with an X? Yeah, let's do that. All right. So my tool today is comics, C-O-M-I-X. And the way this works is um, it's a comic book reader. Oh, actually, if you search for comics, it's a third, you get a bunch of one. weird... Yeah, if you, it's a, it goes under the title GTK Comic Book Viewer. But basically, the way it works is... Um, Comics come in this format called CBZ, and they also have another format called CBR. And all it is is just a zip file with a bunch of images in it, or in this, or in the CBR case, a RAR file. Uh, what this comics does is it opens the zip uh, in memory, it loads all the pictures, and it provides this really slick interface for you to go through the comics. So it'll actually, you can hit spacebar, and it'll go from frame to frame, like it kind of intelligently figures out the layout of or guesses at the layout of the comic and will let you navigate through and uh, let you read the comics faster. Uh, it does some uh, also some sampling and things like that to make them a little uh, sharper, make the images clearer. So I use it a lot. I like it. So do you use this mostly on your uh, computer at home or on your phone? or? Yeah, so I mainly use this on my MacBook when I travel. That's most of the time when I'm reading comics and traveling and I believe this they have a version if it's not if it's not comics it'll be something else but they have comic book readers for the uh for the iPad and for the iPhone too so keep in mind if you if you're a big comic book fan and uh you subscribe to like digital comic books um those CBZ files and CBR files um can be opened in a ton of different viewers and uh some of them have some really smart capability like this comics one so just keep your eyes out and you can make your comic reading experience a little better nice nice yeah i, I just never really got into comic book reading growing up i don't know why so oh really but i, I do an occasion like reading comic book see i i never got into it until i found out uh, like the world beyond superhero comic books, you know, like I never really got into Spider-Man. I got into X-Men a little bit. I wasn't really into Batman. But then I started finding out about, you know, I guess I'll say more modern ones like The Walking Dead and uh, 300. You know, yeah. And you know, Scrooge McDuck is a comic. It's actually no. like endorsed by Disney, but it's not like a little children's comic. It's actually kind of really. Yeah, it's kind of like has not a I wouldn't say an adult theme because adult has sort of connotations there, but it's sort of it deals with some kind of mature topics and the the, the humor is sort of high concept. Hmm. It's really surprising for Disney. Um So what you're saying is if I read it I wouldn't understand it. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of high concept, so it's no way of saying, you know, uh, I don't know. I see your nose <laughs> pointing high into the air, sir. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what are you reading there, sir? Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, well, only the finest. <laughs> I'm sure the Dos Equis guy reads read Scrooge McDuck. Oh, the most interesting man in the world. Okay, interesting. I'll have to call him and ask him. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can get him on the show. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I could see him. You know, I don't drink, but when I do, I like Dos Equis and my Scrooge McDuck comics. It just it flows. 
You Scott should be Rizzo. a screenwriter. <laughs> I don't know who would watch your shows, but they'd be funny. <laughs> so what about you, man? What, what's, uh, what's your tool of the day? So, so you and I talked about this a little bit before, but I have my tool of the day just for sheer interestingness of concept, the Bitcoin. So oh, nice. Bitcoin, the reason part of it, I was just thinking about it again today as I saw that they released a Java version of it. But Bitcoin is a program that you run on your computer that's a peer-to-peer -peer program for doing uh, money transaction. So, you know, eventually it's a new currency based on, I, I guess, cryptographic principles. Uh, I still haven't fully uh, put my head around what it is yet, but a way of creating a finite supply of things, which if you have a finite supply of things can become money, I guess, or you know, money can be whatever, and uh, doing transactions. So a way of doing transactions in a peer-to-peer -peer manner that's you know uh, more easily authenticated in a non-centralized way. And so a very interesting concept. And so part of the initial thing now is doing the computations to generate these Bitcoins. And if you get this Bitcoin client, not only can you do transactions, you can also be involved in essentially printing money or printing bit money. Um, That's and pretty so, cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the, the whole, uh, you know, if we look back at currency, you know, in history or whatever, they always look for things that are, are hard to, hard to generate or hard to replace. So like, you know, the Greeks, I believe it was the Greeks or maybe the Romans used salt for currency. Mm -hmm. That's where salary comes from. Oh, I did not know that. Sal, salt, so salary was your being Man, paid in salt. Busting out the verbal skills there. It's impressive. Oh, that's it. I'm done. No more. <laughs> <laughs> that was the limit. Oh man, that's your one time. No. So, uh, so, you know, they used, uh, they used salt and then later on, you know, I mean, even to this day, gold is used. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, money used to be actually backed by gold and you could trade it, trade one for the other. Well, I guess you can still at some level, right? I mean, you can't trade a dollar bill in and get the government to give you gold, but you could trade your dollar bill to somebody in exchange for some amount of gold. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So a very, very small used. sliver of gold at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or you can, uh, trade in your watch to uh, some guy in the in the mall who will give you a small amount of money for it. Yeah, trade in your $30,000 gold watch and he'll give you 20 bucks for it. Isn't that crazy, the We Buy Gold frenzy that there is out there? Well, I mean, I, I guess the price has gone up so much. But the problem is that they're giving you, aside from the scamminess of some of the people, I mean, they're giving you the price for the raw material of gold in the item not the workmanship craftsmanship you know intrinsic or the what is it, i guess extrinsic value or intrinsic extrinsic value extrinsic yeah yeah so i mean they're not giving you anything for that so the fact that it's a lovely crafted you know gold chain necklace they weigh it see how much gold's in it and that's what they're going to base their payment to you off of yeah that's interesting you know because in the commercials that make it seem like all of these necklaces and rings are going to some foundry and getting melted down well in practice, they're probably, you know, just turning that around and reselling it. That's true. They probably make more money that way. Yeah, I think people probably feel more comfortable knowing that, you know, grandma's brooch is getting melted down. So then somebody else is going to be wearing it. Yeah, keep the facade going. And I think, I don't know if it was you or someone else. Someone was telling me that they actually uh, take like the diamonds out. Like some people will turn in a ring with a diamond in it and they'll just pay them for the gold, but then they'll turn around and sell the diamond too. Oh, no, that wasn't me. That's... I. I know other, you know, kind of I guess, scams that work like that, right? You know, come, you go to the flea market or go to some place, pawn shop, right? And you try to pawn something. And if the guy thinks you don't know what the value of the item is, he'll try to, you know, basically give you as little as possible for it. Yeah, yeah, so definitely. You have a, you know, original Monet picture, you know, and he says, oh, this is a print. You know, I give you 20 bucks for it. And he turns around and sells it for 30000 Oh, man, that is, that is pretty shady. I have no idea how much art sells for, so... I, I think probably... thirty thousand. That's how much every piece sells for. Uh, that's how much I'd pay for it in modern art. But <laughs> that's right. That's right. We should have a board game of the of board the day. Game of the day? Ooh, interesting. interesting. The board game programming language or something. Mm, okay. So so tell me some more about Bitcoin. So basically, you're so some computers, I guess, are calculating um, bitcoins, but there's only so many of them. And eventually, you'll get to the point where you know, no amount of programming will, will get you the next coin. Right. That pool will be exhausted. And at that point, you know, you will 
trade services if you want Bitcoin. Services are bits or atoms. Um, so it may be, for instance, you want to have web hosting and you could exchange some of the Bitcoins that you spent your time on your PC to make for web hosting on somebody else's computer, which they can use to turn around and trade for actual dollars to do something else with or whatever. I mean, at that point, it is it's just another currency. It's just how many people will actually accept it as payment and as a form of trade. This kind of reminds me a little bit of um, you know, back when I used to do Top Coder, uh, you know, Google is intimately involved with with Top Coder, and now they they have their own called Google Code Jam. But uh, uh, they actually gave Gmail accounts, like some of the first Gmail accounts, to uh, people who participated in the Top Coder Collegiate Challenge back in like 2003 or something like that, when Gmail was brand new. And at the time, people were uh, selling their invites. Like, if you could invite somebody else to Gmail, he would, you know, give you a free tour of DC. It's like they had a whole list of things that you could buy for your Gmail account. Yeah, I mean, anything can become currency, I guess. Uh, It's just how many people will accept it. And I guess the idea with Bitcoin is that it's a provable, finite amount of things. And it's because of the peer-to-peer decentralized nature, it's very hard to scam or do fraudulent activities on. So that math, it's kind of a mathematical proof of uh, stability, I guess. So other oh, people should should be willing to trust it, as opposed to, uh, to regardless of your political beliefs, um, what the government has decided to do in our country, which is just print more money. Um, <laughs> and so kind of breaking the fundamental assumption that you know at a derived level how much money there is by how much things cost. And then all of a sudden, you know, if there's twice as much money in the world, your money is half as valuable. Yeah, exactly. I, I think there's like... Oversimplifying to a great extent macroeconomics. Yeah. <laughs> They must publish, right, how many bills they print. Otherwise, there'd be no way to, you know, keep track of inflation, right? I I, don't know. I it gets beyond my grasp to think about things like that. Yeah, beyond, me too. It's, it's very interesting. I love thinking about it, but it's outside of my uh, comfort zone. Yeah, there's like an economic podcast out there where they're explaining everything in detail and uh, and we're just making it up. So. Yeah, <laughs> but hey, whatever. <laughs> It sounds good to you. No, that's bad advice. That's bad advice. (laughs) So, you know, the other thing about this Bitcoin is because it is peer to peer um, and because it's free to sort of to sort of, you know, join this this network, Mm -hmm. it could get very popular, which is really important. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, one of the big failings of sort of early civilizations were, you know, each colony had its own. I know in the Roman times, each emperor had their own coin. And so none of them really carried, um, no pun intended, but carried their weight because uh, they're constantly getting phased out by something else. So Mm it'd be interesting to see if Bitcoin sort of survives the test of time and if it gets popular enough to, you know, hit that critical mass where people will start trading real money for it. Yeah, I got interested in it for a while, then kind of just thought it maybe was just a curio, a curiosity, and then I saw it pop up again today and it's kind of like, ooh, I keep hearing this. Maybe I can get on the ground floor or something awesome. (laughs) Yeah, it's good stuff. All right. So uh, for the programming language of the day, I guess uh, for this first podcast, we decided to talk about C. Yeah, definitely. C is a, C is an awesome language. It's a procedural language, which means that um, you know it's designed to go kind of one line at a time, as opposed to some of the other languages like Lisp, which is functional, in which case you know, you don't necessarily know where you are at any given time. You know, and with C, there's like a very specific main function. And, uh, you know, you're calling other functions and things like that. But but uh, it's rather easy to sort of step through a program in C and see what's going on. Right. I guess the other word for that sometimes is imperative. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So um, I, I guess it's kind of hard to talk about C because most of my other things are defined in terms of how they relate to C. So it's, it's like defining the base thing. It's, it's kind yeah. of. Yeah. It's like, it's like the dictionary definition for the must have the in it, you know? I'm yeah. assuming. Uh, I don't know. Or it's just not in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might not be. So C is, interestingly, a lot of C is written in C. And this is something that is a trend that you'll probably find as you listen to the shows is that a lot of languages are written in themselves. And what that means is, you know, they come up with very low level um, interfaces to the, uh, you know, to the language, usually built in a lower level language. So, for example, 
uh, C has functions like open and write, which are directly go down to kernel function calls, which end up working their way down to assembly. So C is built on these low-level assembly routines, but then also there is like fwrite, which is writing to a file, and fopen, which is opening a file. These functions are written in C. So someone has gone in and, and written a definition for fopen, which invokes the right kernel calls depending on your OS and things like that. So, I mean, I guess the way that works, um, you know, is that the first version's written purely in assembly, and then somebody is able to compile C to assembly and do that to a point where you can do everything you would need to do. And then I guess at that point you bootstrapped and then you can have a compiler entirely in the language which it's compiling. Exactly. That's exactly right. So C, you know, the whole uh, or, or the vast majority of the Linux kernel is written in C, if not the entire thing. Mm. Um, Linus Torvalds is a huge C fan. He has this uh, part on his blog where he just is tearing apart C++ and all these other languages. I didn't know that. Yeah, let's see if I can find it. Here, if I find it... Um, that's, well, that's, that's interesting. I'll, hmm. Yeah, I'll send this to you and I'll link it to the forums. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people I know who, um, especially in the industry where we're at, that claim to write C++, you know, and that just means that they have a .cpp file, but in reality, they're writing C code. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Which at yeah, some level, I mean, C++ and C code are very, very close to each other. And, and in fact, I mean, you can, it's perfectly valid to write C code in a C++ file. But I guess you're, it's more of the style that we're talking about there, the way you kind of break things down, write classes, those kinds of things. Yeah, so C++, you know, which we'll talk about in another episode, but adds sort of an object-oriented layer on top of C. But uh, in fact, the very first C++ compiler is actually compiled down to C. So the, the first one written by Straustrup or whatever was, its output was a C file that you then compiled again. Mm. So uh, um, C would be then a very low level language, right? I mean... Yeah, in fact, uh, you can actually type assembly code um, straight, you know, in line with your C code. So you could be writing some C code. You could be saying f open to open this file, and then uh, you know load this load you know int i equals zero. All these C uh, things you're used to seeing, but then all of a sudden you can put asm open parenthesis, and now you can put assembly code right there. Bam. Whoa, and that's so, pretty hardcore, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is this is like emerald cooking here, you know, where bam, you just go right, bam, and the assembly There's shows assembly up. right there. Yeah, and if you look at the Quake. Uh, three source code, which is, you know, Quake 3 is open source now. You can actually see there's places, especially in the physics routines, where he, um, you know, there's all this C code, and it gets to the point where he wants to do some math, like, say, figure out um, gravity's effect on everything in the game. And, uh, you know, for those old processors, it uh, uh, it all had to be done in assembly, and you'll just see a, a huge block of assembly code there. Wow. Yeah, I I mean, I have done that before once or twice, put some assembly code, but I won't lie. It was for the most part looking up, you know, needing to do this to kind of get the OS into a certain mode or do something kind of finicky. And I pretty much just copy and pasted. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The little bit of assembly I've done has been kind of the same, just looking up on the Internet what to do. And um, I don't know. Does anybody really program in assembly nowadays? Yeah, I mean, I did program assembly in college working on... Uh, uh, you know, like on DSP type things or the Motorola 6812 kind of CPUs, the old old school stuff. I mean, you can write uh, in assembly and it works pretty good. I mean, for something that has, you know, really fast interrupts you need to be able to do or, um, you know, a really low level processor that doesn't have a really good C compiler or C compiler oh, leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, you can get big a big advantage writing in assembly. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are still people that do it, but... Uh, you know, it's probably very minute at this point, I would say. Somebody will write in and say that's all they do and prove us wrong. But we welcome yeah, I mean, programming use... throwdown at gmail.com. <laughs> that's right. If you use uh, a lot of assembly at work, uh, we'd like to hear from you and, and uh, hear about kind of your experiences with it and what, what its applications are nowadays. And Actually, I take that back. I did some assembly, but it was, uh, it was SSE. So uh, I was writing SSE um, code for... Uh, um, did some work for on the Bullet physics engine, so this open source physics engine. 
Um, but again, it's basically it was like I just need to loop through these numbers and multiply these two arrays together, and so the code ended up not being very complicated. Huh? Yeah. Um. Interesting. Yeah, I guess people still do it for a lot of things. I, yeah. It's one of those things I guess it just falls out of the mainstream and people kind of forget about it. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, you know, as time goes on, if if you know C and C plus plus are going to go sort of the way of assembly. Hmm. It's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, because I did SSE stuff, but I did it in C. Um, they have C, I guess, bindings for it, or I don't know what the right term is there. But you can actually oh, nice. write C code to do SSE. And I have done that before. But it's pretty close to assembly. I mean, it's nothing fancy. It's not much better than just the writing in assembly probably would be. Oh, gotcha. But yeah, other things about C. So so I got this uh, link you sent me. Yeah, uh, I guess Linus Torvalds does have a big beef against C++. I know. I, I, uh, I would hate to, to go up against him in a C competition. Here you go. <laughs> C++ is a horrible language. It's made more horrible by the fact that a lot of substandard programmers use it to the point <laughs> where it's much easier to generate total and utter crap with it. Um, I think that, you know, this is a case of... Um, you know, I mean, Linus Torvalds is is extremely gifted, right? Um, but he did a lot of his stuff when C++ compilers were terrible. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that technology has come a really long way. I, I kind of had this um, experience with um, with Python where, you know, in the beginning at Python, let's say 1 or whenever I was looking at it, it was just extremely slow. And, you know, it was every line was interpreted. You don't have um, Psycho, which is... a uh, just-in-time compiler for Python, uh, you know, that wasn't around then and all that stuff. So I got really bad taste from all that. It was just extremely slow and it had bugs. It, I got this bus error. I didn't know what that meant. Uh, and it really took, you know, going back years later and, and you know, discovering the language again to uh, to get an appreciation for it. And I think that might be a little bit of what's going on here. Yeah. I mean, it's written pretty recently, 2007. So it wasn't that long ago. Um, yeah, I mean, when he wrote it, the compilers are definitely in a good state. Yeah, so uh, uh, maybe it is a holder. I don't know. Maybe we'll get him on the show and we'll ask him. Yeah, oh, that'd be sweet. <laughs> we can have wishful thinking here yeah, in our yeah. episode one. That that doesn't sound, you know, we should, yeah. Got to set our sights high. Shoot for right. the shoot for the moon, and if you miss, you'll land upon the stars. <laughs> That's right. Swing for the fences, yep. or if you're being held up in an alley. Did you just you use a sports analogy on a programming I... podcast? <laughs> Fail. Oh man, I never played baseball, so I I don't think I've ever even watched baseball. Really, you've never seen a baseball game? I, I mean, I saw on TV once. Oh yeah, I guess it's just too oh, yeah, boring. I'm... Oh, I'm gonna we're gonna get tons of people. Let's stop <laughs> oh, this. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is interesting. Um, you know, glancing over this Linus Torvalds thing, he has a point here that that I've seen some stuff recently about that's kind of interesting. Where he says that um, that uh, he says, quite frankly, even if the choice of C were to do nothing but keep the C plus plus programmers out, that in itself would be a huge reason to use C. And this is kind of interesting. I saw somebody else. Um, who was it? Uh, we'll find it later, but um, somebody was writing and saying that one reason to use new programming languages like um, like Scala or Clojure or you know some some kind of fancy new thing is that if you write your applications in that language and you're a I guess small enough agile enough company to be able to do these kinds of things that um, if you write your application in those uh, things you're going to attract kind of the best programmers because you know the run-of-the-mill average programmers aren't going to go out there and learn these complicated functional programming languages so if if nothing else the people who are going to apply to your job openings who are going to want to work on your projects are going to be people who are kind of the you know cream of the crop who are out there trying to pursue these interesting and and you know perhaps game-changing ideas and so if you you know kind of similar to linus's point here can we call him that should we call him mr Torvalds? sure no uh, linus is fine you know the to his point here that you know it's interesting you're you know kind of the theme of this podcast choosing your language kind of chooses who's gonna be attracted to working on it or working with you and that has consequences good and bad at every choice yeah, I mean, so, con you know, continuing with that, the more programming languages you know and that you can sort of put on your resume and, and speak in an educated way about, um, the better you're going to do. Because if you find that one guy who, uh, you know, 
who uh, Ada is his is his love and joy. Um, and if you can talk uh, intelligently about that, um, you might have an advantage. Yeah. Um, and you had a good point there. Put programming languages on your resume that you can talk intelligently about. That's a pet peeve of mine. People who put programming languages on their resume and they couldn't even write a hello world in that language. Don't do that. Yep. No, that do makes not. you look terrible. In general, um, you don't want to put things on your resume that you're not really good in. Just because if nothing else, let's just say you're this guy and you're just um, uh, uh, interviewing you. You're on the other side of the, of the, of the desk. Uh, and they just randomly pick at something and it happens to be something you don't know. I mean, it's going to be devastating. So you mm-hmm. want to make sure that if someone throws a dart at your resume, it's going to land on something that, that you can speak about. Yep. yep. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I mean, you got anything more to say about C? Uh, There's so see. much to say that it's almost hard to pick what to talk about. Yeah. So, well, let's talk a little bit about just the sort of different characteristics of C. So, um, you know, C is very low level. It, uh, it relies heavily on the compiler, so C doesn't have its own, um, uh, you know, memory management. It doesn't have like a garbage collection or anything like that. You have to do all the malics and freeze mm-hmm. yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's um, a pro and a con. Yeah, it's a pro in the sense that you know, you're if you program something, you have a good idea of how much time and how much memory it's going to take. Um, it can also be very consistent. You know, you can allocate your memory up front. Versus something like if you've used MATLAB or Python, uh, you know, every time you do an operation, you might be uh, allocating more memory. And that very next operation might be the one that allocates so much memory that your computer has to sort of reorganize. And that could be ex- that could take a very long time. Uh, in C, it puts C puts you in the driver's seat. So, you know, you know, when you're allocating and deallocating memory, you know, when you're going to take a performance hit for doing something. Um, you know, you can watch uh, your buffers, and if they start to get too full, you could decide when to, uh, you know, make them larger, etc. Yeah. Um, C really leaves you in in uh, in your own hands there. Yeah, I mean, I guess other languages try to address that, right? I mean, in Python, you can do stuff to try to make it allocate in advance, but ultimately, that's not the way it's intended to be used. And C is right. kind of the default way is to make it be used that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But a lot of people mess it up. A lot of people forget to free stuff or, you know, try to dereference, you know, bad pointers and they get tri- tripped up, you know, in, in managing their memory correctly. And that's a dangerous thing because it can make your program crash. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, the other thing, C does not give you a safety net. So uh, in Java, if um, you have some array that's 10 elements and you try and access the 11th one, um, Java has a virtual machine. So Java has a sort of like a computer inside a computer. And we'll, we'll talk about this more later. But, uh, you know, and the, the, the simulated computer on the inside will, uh, will fail and will throw an error back. Um, in C, you're talking straight to your own, to your hardware. So you're talking straight to your memory, to the processor, to any disks you have. And uh, if, you know, you have an array of size 12 and you go for the 14th element, um, it's just going to pick whatever is there in that memory and return it. it. It'll probably be some crazy number. If you're expecting it between 1 and 100, you might get, you know, 2 million. Yeah. Um, but well, the real danger, the real danger isn't that though. I mean, that is dangerous. The danger is when it works most of the time, but then, you know, the critical moment you're demoing for your boss or, you know, worse, the customer, you know, and all of a sudden that's the time that the way it's allocated happens to be that that memory is being used for something else or it's, you know, used by the operating system or something. And it's instead of returning the value you've expected every other time, like let's say zero, now it does return something different because you it isn't what you thought it was. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, these problems, they start to show up um, in production. So, for example, uh, let's say you have an array of 10,000 for your, let's say you're Amazon and you're categorizing books in C uh, and you gave the space for, you know, let's say a million books. Uh, but now you roll this out to the production environment and you surpass a million books or a, ma- a million comments on books. Now you're, you've overridden that array and who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. When you go back to your simulated environment, you're never going to find that error because it depends on something that you can only experience in, in large production. volume. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. It also points out the importance of testing. Yeah, definitely. So and, we should uh, actually, maybe the next show, um, our goal is to kind of, 
do like a little explanation of language and then on the next show kind of do a little recap. Maybe in the recap and kind of the tool section, we'll talk about Valgrind and some of those other Ooh, tools that you point. can use. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we, we probably should, you know, maybe we should have done this before, but, uh, you know, probably should come up with kind of a, uh, a format for everything. Like I was thinking about, we should also talk about libraries. So, for instance, C, you know, just libraries, a lot of people kind of call C, well, later programming languages kind of poke fun at C by saying these languages are batteries included. That's a Python saying, I guess, right? That, yep. you know, it comes with all of the other stuff you might need versus C doesn't. Um, but there are a lot of libraries you can pull from that give you a lot of powerful tools in C, you know, that, uh, and especially, I guess, C++, but a lot of libraries out there that give you functionality or uh, reusability um, and get, you know, help you build up that code base a lot faster than if you had to do everything from scratch. So it has good library support, I would say. Yeah, definitely. C and C++, it, it seems like every, every uh, you know, program out there either has a C, C++ version or, or is solely C, C++ and yeah. then has bindings for everything else. But those aren't always straightforward. I mean, having used a number of libraries, they can range in difficulty from very easy to integrate to next to impossible to get working in your program. Yeah, definitely. So not a lot of consistency on that front. No, and yeah, that's actually a good point. So let's talk a little bit about the different C standards. Um, I don't know a lot about the history of it, but at this point right now, there's basically two C standards. There's the, I guess we'll call it the Microsoft C standard, and then there's the, uh, was it C99? ANCC? Well, there's ANSI C, and then C99. No, the, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I'm calling that the Microsoft one, since they're the only ones that really, like, you know, stick to that one, but... Um, but yeah, there's, so Wait, for example, one? to NCC. No, 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 no. NCC was what, I mean, that's what like GCC complied to, right? Before now like C99 coming out, right? I mean, Microsoft kind of invented their own subset of NCC that they complied with. And then they've gotten better over time to now they're actually pretty compliant in my understanding. Oh, maybe, maybe I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'm thinking of NCC, I think. That's what I was talking about. All Hang right, on. so keep going. Go to your original point anyways. Well, let me, I'm looking it up right now. Okay, so so then there was C99, which, I mean, didn't change anything drastic, right? I mean, it just kind of added support for some new data types and uh, bigger numbers, that kind of stuff. Yeah, let me... Uh, da, 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 da. All right. The other thing um, that if you hear people talking about C, there, there are a lot of bad things you can do in C. Um, C gives you a lot of power, um, but with great power comes great responsibility. And, <laughs> That's uh, right. And so, you know, they'll do things, they give you like macros, um, they give you all sorts of ability to, you know, have pointers to functions and, you know, have lists of functions that you can call and change with what function does when. And I mean, it gives you all sorts of, you know, we say crazy things, but in some cases, those are really necessary to be able to do those kind of non-standard, unexpected, hard to wrap your brain around functions. But in other cases, they can be used for, you know, ossification or uh, not that any of us would ever do this, but showing off. And so people <laughs> will try to show off by using, what are those called, the tertiary operators, you know, yeah, like right. questions and you know, if you've ever seen the obfuscated C contest, um, people can write, you know, just completely unreadable C source code that's completely valid, complies with the standards, and compiles, and is fast. Um, but you could never read it. Um, yeah, it's impossible. Much less change it. Uh, so here's what I was thinking. There's, okay, yeah, back to There point. is ANC, yeah, it's fine. There's ANSI C, and then there's C99, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, the newer one. And so Microsoft Visual Studio doesn't support C99. It okay. only supports the ANSI C. Okay. And this is this is a problem because like FFmpeg, for example, which is a video streaming library, is written in C99. So to use it in Visual Studio, you'd have to, you know, just go through and hack hack the entire code base. And everywhere where you see something that isn't compliant, you have to go in and fix it. Hmm. Yeah, it'd be just, it'd be massive. So there are, you know, two different standards. And the hope is that, you know, all of the compilers will start to get to the point where they're supporting C99. Yeah, that I, the com cross compiler, cross platform, you know, that in C, C++, because you really are, you know, compiling right down to machine code. It's a pro and a con, but, you know, the con is that you got to be very careful about what you're doing because the way one thing works on one platform could be completely different from the way it works on another. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So 
the difference between C and C++ uh, from other languages like Python or Java is that, you know, as we talked about earlier, they're, they're talking directly to the machine. And so there's a, they're, and more specifically, they're talking directly to the operating system. So you have to use a compiler specific to your type of hardware and to your OS. Um, so, you know, in the case of Windows, you have some choices. You can use um, Visual C++, which is a Microsoft product. Um, you could use GCC uh, for Windows. Uh, it's called MingGW, which is a minimalist GNU for Windows, is what MingGW stands mm -hmm. for. Um, you can also uh, use Intel. They have a compiler. Um, on the Linux side... There's a couple uh, of others too, right? Uh, less popular uh, now, but there's the... Um... Borland had one for a while, right? Borland oh, CMI. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, but sorry, go ahead. Not to interrupt you. Oh, no, it's cool. I threw you off I'm, your... I'm pulling case. up... No, no, it's cool. I'm pulling up C compilers right now. Yeah, on Wikipedia, you'll see there's a ton of them. Turbo C, you remember that ah, one? Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, back in the day. All right, so, uh, and then on Linux? Oh, yeah, on Linux, there is... um, You know, GCC is the heavy hitter on Linux. You know, just about everything is going to be built in that. Um, ICC, which is the Intel compiler... Our Intel uh, C compiler that uh, that's also on Linux. Um, <clears throat> but oh, so the point of this is the programs that you create with C or C++ will be specific to that operating system and that hardware. So you know, in, in Java, for example, you can create a .class file, which is you know your your compiled source code, and run that on any machine. So I can compile some Java code on my machine and then go to a, another Linux machine or go to an ARM machine or go anywhere and, and run that code, and it'll run just fine. Uh, if you build an executable in C and then take it over to your Mac and try and run it, you're going to be in trouble. It's not going to know what to do with that. Uh, you can do cross-compilation, though, right? I mean, on a Windows machine, you could tell your compiler to compile it for a Macintosh. Yeah, definitely. That's a good point. So you can do that, but whichever you decide, it's going to be... Um, it's going to be set to that. So mm -hmm. you can't compile something that will work on several different architectures. And, and the other thing to point out, I mean, I guess to us we kind of forget about it, but you don't have to have an operating system to be able to use C. I mean, there are many people writing. The operating system itself is written in C um, yeah, or C++ definitely. for the most part. I mean, there are exceptions. Um, but most of the serious ones, like you pointed out earlier, Linux, I mean, Windows is written in C, C++. Um, so the pro operating system itself is written in those languages because it doesn't presume that there's an operating system running. I mean, it can. So if you write code compiled for Windows to do GUI stuff, for instance, it's going to assume there's an operating system there. But there's other right. ways to write it where those assumptions aren't necessary and that you can have code that runs without an operating system. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so if you're wondering why this is, you know, why in Java and Python um, you can write your code and you can create the PYC files in Python or the class files in Java and, and just send those around across the Internet and just know that they'll work on the other person's machine. That's because those people, so like Guido in the case of Python or uh, do you know who made Java? Oh, I should. Here, let's look it up. Don't put me on the spot. You're make, you're ruining our street <laughs> cred. <laughs> uh, history. I guess James Goslin, Gosling, James Gosling, Mike Sheridan, and Patrick. I mean, there's Naughton. a couple guys there who are kind of famous and have gone on to work on other languages as well. But I'm yeah, not as up on that history right. as I should be. Shh, you, you were supposed to tell me we we're going to talk about this before. <laughs> <laughs> so I could sound smart. We'll cut, we'll cut all this out. Oh, Actually, okay, we'll okay. say we'll say we'll cut it out, and we won't. Yeah, just I'm, <laughs> I'm lazy. So uh, these people have gone to painstaking process, uh, uh, time and effort into making sure that when you do, you know, 0.5 plus 0.5 in Python, that it's going to give you 1.0 on every single machine, or when you you know, create an array, when you create a string, or when you try and access a GUI, when you try and create a, a GUI, that it um, that it works the same or or as close to the same as it can in every OS. Um, that's one of the nice things about Java is you can uh, make a GUI and uh, and just know that it'll work on every computer. You know, with C and C++, um, you're typically coding for your for your hardware and your OS. True. 
True. Yeah, there are some libraries that um, can sort of make things cross-platform, and uh, maybe we should talk about some of those. Yeah, we'll have to get to those, definitely, definitely. Yeah, so So much to see. talk about, so little time. Yeah, I don't know of any C ones. I use mostly C++ ones, but oh, I guess I'll mention one. a couple. Um, Agar is a C library for um, for GUIs that is cross-platform. What does that use, uh, like OpenGL on the back end, or, or right. is it, do you know? Yeah, it so it actually has several different backends, um, but I think OpenGL is one of them. Okay. Um, do you know any? Like, you want to throw in one or two C C libraries? C uh, man, see, I'm gonna say something, and it's gonna be C plus plus, and then we're gonna feel kind of bad. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so hard, right? Because yeah, it's hard to know. I mean, a lot of the stuff I do for like low level timing, doing analysis on my code and profiling type stuff, most of those are, are you know, just C, just for the sake of they don't need to be C++ and that keeps them more compatible. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. There's a number of platform specific libraries that are C for, for instance, if you do coding on the TI DSPs, TI has a set of fixed point libraries that are in C. Ah, oh, true. Because That's some of their right. DSPs don't have floating point support, or the floating point support is uh, large or slow, and or slow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another one is uh, XPAT, which is a XML parsing library. Are you just continuing That's to show C. me up by telling me how many you can name and I can't name any? Yeah, this is like name that, I guess, well, was there a game show like that where it's like you have to keep going? We should invent one. Yeah, we'll invent our own game show. We'll write it in C. How about and then that? And we'll win. <laughs> that's right and we'll have a memory overrun so we'll oh that's something else we, we should lost. point out the security uh, there's a number of security problems with c and c plus plus not inherent but if you're not careful um for instance you take input from uh from the command line somebody could give you a just absolutely gigantic uh string and cause a uh i guess at that point a buffer overflow Yep. So uh, we don't want we don't have time to get into that right now, but um, yeah, we can do a whole show on on all that stuff. But yeah, I mean, if you you know you read in the news as we talked about at the beginning of the show, that guy who hacked the PS3 and whatever, and a lot of these hacks, these hardware hacks, what they're doing is C is such a low level that they're going in and adding electricity to the traces running between two chips, causing numbers to be bigger than they should be, and they're just waiting for someone for for a flaw in the C program. And for them to be able to get access to some block of memory that that was generally restricted. This is good stuff. So, uh, you know, I I think call it here for our first episode. It's been pretty good, Jason. Yeah, I think this has been great. I've, I've had a lot of fun. All right. Well, uh, that's it for today. See you guys in uh, two weeks. Yeah, definitely. See you guys later. Have hope you have fun programming and see. Go out and learn something new. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind. The intro music is Axo by Binar Pilot.